We made sure that every kid in our state gets breakfast and lunch every day. So while other states were banning books from their schools, we were banishing hunger from ours. We're back with The Big Deal. I'm Errol Lewis, and that was Minnesota Governor and Vice Presidential Candidate Tim Walz discovering how his state provides all students with free breakfast and lunch, a policy that he enacted. Walz's nomination has brought the issue of universal school meals into the spotlight, especially as students across the country head back to the classroom following summer break. We break down the numbers. More than 11 million children ate breakfast for free in the 2022-2023 school year, and about 19 million ate lunch at no cost, while another 1 million paid a reduced price and 8.5 million paid full price. The amount that children pay is based on their family's income. So a family of four earning $40,000 a year or less qualifies for free meals. Meanwhile, if that same family's annual income is higher than $57,000, their child would have to pay full price for the meal. The Universal Meals program originally gained traction during the pandemic when all children were offered free food at school regardless of income. And since its expiration two years ago, eight states, including Minnesota, have found one way or another to continue that initiative. They all have Democratic governors, except for Vermont. Now, more than two dozen other states are now exploring similar actions in an attempt to eliminate meal costs for their students as well, and that includes some school districts like Durham Public Schools in North Carolina. Spectrum News reporter Gina Gartner has the report in this story. Sometimes it get a little hectic, but it's worth it to see the kids come through and, and, and all excited about eating. Lunch has always been the busiest part of the day for Michelle Vaughn at Easley well, Elementary School like in Durham. What would you like, sweetheart? But Vaughn says it's been even busier since the district began providing free breakfast and lunch to all students. There you go, sweetie. There's a little bit of trial and error in guessing how many meals to prepare. Last year, this elementary school averaged 150 cafeteria lunches. Now with the new program, they're up to 278. Vaughn says she knows how impactful free meals can be on any family. When my son was going to school, my oldest two got the reduced or free lunch. But my last one, we had to always pay for his lunch. And sometimes it's hard when you got to pay for lunch. Even if you even if you're in a two-parent working household, sometimes that can get a little bit, you know, I'm getting emotional. Sometimes that can get a little bit hard. Dr. Lyndon Thayer, Assistant Director of Food Systems Planning, says the new program will help their families regardless of income. This really helps move the needle on some of our big core values and sort of our, our goals as a district, including working towards equity um, for all of our students. The Community Eligibility Provision is a Department of Agriculture program that focuses on low-income households. Although DPS doesn't get full reimbursement because not all kids qualify to participate, they took the extra step to provide equally for all their students. The hope is the program helps remove the stigma surrounding free school meals. Lunch and breakfast become like class, right? You're just expected to show up in your English class. You're expected to come and participate in science. Now you can come to breakfast and lunch class too. She says on average, a family with two kids will save around $1,200 in benefits because their students have access to these free meals. Vaughn came out of retirement after five months just for this job because she loves the kids. It's wonderful. Some of them come in here, you know, they have a bad day sometime, especially in the morning. And, you know, you kind of just cheer them up and they make your day, too. See, like that smile on her face. <laughs> Joining me now to talk more about the politics of universal school meals is Joel Berg. He's the CEO of the nonprofit organization Hunger Free America. And uh, Joel, your organization has done a lot of research on this. Um, this not only keeps children fed, which I think we all agree is a great idea, but it also um, heavily impacts their performance in the classroom, right? Absolutely, Errol. To be schooled, you must be fueled. To be well-read, you must be well-fed. Those are my two Dr. Seuss moments there. But the bottom line is there's a boatload of data that feeding children nutritious breakfast and lunch increases their test scores, reduces their absenteeism, improves their chances of uh, graduation, thus boosts our economy in the long term. And your research has also found that about a third of students who qualify for free or reduced price lunches aren't taking advantage of it. Now, why is that? And how does making it universal affect that? 
families have to fill out forms and not every family needs to fill out forms or wants to fill out forms. And also we need to understand that if you make this universal, this is sort of a middle class tax cut. Because right now, upper middle class or lower middle class families may be just above the income cutoff. So if you have two kids in public schools, you can easily save $720 a year in not having to buy lunches and breakfast for your kids. So it's just smart policy. We're talking big numbers, though. How, how much would it cost? I mean, I know federal legislation has been, you know, kind of at a standstill it, it, on well, this Well, everything's relative. By my calculation, it would cost a few billion dollars of federal funds, but it could easily save billions of dollars at the school district and the state level because there'd be all this less paperwork. And I have to point out, a new aircraft carrier is about $13 billion, and I've got to respectfully suggest feeding our kids does far more to advance national security than one more weapon. Well, you know, you, you're, it, you're not just persuasive, but you're in line with where most Americans are. A poll last year found that six in 10 Americans support providing free meals to all students. So now what's the argument ag against doing it? Once upon a time, even some liberals opposed this because they said, oh, the rich kids shouldn't get free anything. But the truth of the matter is not many rich kids are in public schools in America. Look, I played mediocre JV soccer growing up in the New York City suburbs. I got a free jersey. I got free lab equipment. I got a free ride to school. That all is arguably far less of an input to educational performance than free meals. So it's, it's just smart education. It's just smart anti-hunger policy and will save us much money over time. Okay. Now, free school meals have met uh, with some opposition, and it's formal opposition. The Trump campaign has tried to distance itself from uh, Project 2025, and we'll talk about that some other time, whether it really represents where that campaign wants to go. But the next administration, and I'm quoting now from Project 2025, the next administration should focus on students in need and reject efforts to transform federal school meals into an entitlement program. And even as they say that, I am just so struck by this footage, I know, I know you've seen it a million times, of Governor Walz uh, when he signed the legislation to create uh, kind of a universal entitlement for, for kids in his, uh, uh, in his state. Let's, let's take a look at that. Every politician dreams of a moment like that, where the kids swarm him and they hug him and everybody's happy and, and the kids are fed and he's done something uh, great for them. I would think that that would be true of leaders of either party. Yes, and Hunger Free America is studiously nonpartisan. We don't take sides in campaigns. We don't tell people who to vote for. That being said, we know universal school meals are extraordinarily popular. And the very same conservatives who say they're against free giveaways are just fine with tens of billions of payouts to agribusinesses for set prices for food. They're tearing apart supposed price setting by uh, Harris's uh, anti-gouging plans, but they actually support the federal government sets prices for coin, soybeans, and wheat. So again, we don't take sides in campaigns, but we would like a little ideological consistency against people or against big government when it comes to feeding hungry kids, but for it when it comes to rich campaign donors. Oh, well, and, and look, as far as your knowledge of, of um, how politics works, has anybody ever been voted out of office because they fed too many kids and the, the voters threw them out of office? No, and interestingly, this is the first time to my knowledge this has even been a campaign issue in a presidential campaign since 1960 when John F. Kennedy raised the issue of domestic hunger in the debate against Richard Nixon. So the fact that this is even an issue being debated, I think, is very positive for the country. Okay. Thanks very much, Joel. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. Let Spectrum News be your resource for balanced, in-depth political coverage. And click the subscribe button right here. You can also download our app or watch us on TV to learn more about the candidates, where they stand on the issues, and more. We'll see you then.